What's happening? Welcome to the Matt Bernier Show, part of the In The Money Media Network. My name is Matt Bernier. You can follow me on Twitter, at Bernier underscore Matt. Today is Tuesday, May the 31st, the final day of May 2022. It's episode 117 of this show. However you listen, thank you for doing so. Many ways to find the pod. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, InTheMoneyPodcast.com. That's just a few ways you can find the show. You can also find it over on YouTube. Search bar, Matt Burney, your show. You'll get this episode along with the 116 prior. And as always, however you listen, please rate, review, subscribe. Uh, if you're over on YouTube and you are subscribed to the In The Money Media channel, make sure the bell icon's lit up. That way you get notified anytime new content is uploaded to the channel. A little programming note, Thursday, Horse Player Happy Hour is back. Me and PTF, be sure to join us and get involved with the action over on horseplayers.com. I'll talk about that a little bit more as we get closer and closer to it, tweet some things out as well. Uh, but first things first, we gotta pay some bills. We've got some ad reads, and we got a lot of them this week. Let's start with our friends at Santa Anita. Santa Anita's average late pick five payout on Saturdays and Sundays is over $4,700 for a 50 cent wager. And as always, be sure to check out those golden hour wagers. You've got the, the golden hour double, the $5 minimum between Santa Anita and Golden Gate Fields. You've also got the golden hour pick four with the $1 minimum featuring those two racetracks. And as always, a player friendly 12% takeout. You need to be supporting these kind of wagers because in the long run, this is how we're profitable. You need to be taking advantage of these player-friendly wagers, and the Golden Hour wagers are just that out at Santa Anita again. Uh, and don't forget Golden Gate Fields. But more information available at SantaAnita.com. Betmakers, for the first time in over a century, fixed odds betting powered by Betmakers is available on track at Monmouth Park and will soon be available statewide in New Jersey. This is an exciting way to bet that puts the power to get value in your hands the odds you bet are the odds you get. You will be hearing a lot more about fixed odds betting opportunities across the In The Money Media Network. The Delphi Racing Club. The Delphi is a racing club of like-minded people who enjoy horse racing and the camaraderie of being a part of something bigger than themselves. It is a true community. The Delphi offers a fiscally sustainable approach to horse ownership through its patient mid-market acquisition strategy, making yearling purchases in the $75,000 to $150,000 range. This offers partners a chance to compete at the highest levels of the game while doing so in a responsible manner and allowing for long-term participation in the sport. Adelphi has very limited shares available and a couple of exciting two-year-old prospects. Let's start with a New York bred named Gem Mint 10 by Laoban, trained by Ray Handel, looking to debut either this spring at Belmont Park or up north at Saratoga over the summer. And there's also a Taprit cult named Magistrate, currently training at Kinsman Farm in Ocala and will be shipping to the Christoph Clement Barn later this spring. The pedigree suggests distance, wants to run all day, could make for an exciting prospect down the road. Ways to get in touch with Adelphi Racing. AdelphiRacing.com. Email matt at adelphiracing.com and on social media, Instagram at adelphi underscore racing and Twitter at adelphi club. And last but certainly not least, our friends at TaylorMade. TaylorMade partnerships provide an unmatched entry and experience into both the racing and breeding side of the thoroughbred industry. Now you can be a part of top level racing and breeding with all the rewards and less risk and cost. Medallion Racing has enjoyed great success through the years with 66% of starters running in graded stakes races and 25% of those in grade ones. Last year, Medallion was fortunate enough to have an impressive four Breeders' Cup starters. Similarly, our Bloodstock Investments have discovered great value on the breeding side of the game, buying and selling such standouts as Improbable, Bast, Cutting Humor, and Flame Away, among others. Join us and experience the thrill with us, your family, at TaylorMade and Medallion Racing. All great sponsors want to give a big shout out and thank you to all of them. All right, bills are paid. Horse player happy hour again Thursday. Me and PTF, the schedule will be coming out. We'll both be tweeting things out. But if you didn't get involved last year, it's really an ideal opportunity to dip your toe into the contest world. You're supporting a good cause because the juice, the vig, goes to charity, thoroughbred aftercare, taking care of the horses when their job on the racetrack is done. They still need a place to go and live and thrive, and, and hopefully we're doing our little part to help that. And I think also, too, big picture, not just dipping a toe into the contest world. There are big prizes at the end of it. You've got a few Breeders' Cup betting challenge seats that are out there for grabs. So, And if nothing else, come and hang out with us on a Thursday afternoon for a while. We're going to be doing this right through the Breeders' Cup every Thursday, for the most part every Thursday. Um, and I will be on... Almost all of them, there'll be a couple just based on scheduling 
uh, issues that, that will preclude me from enjoying or, or participating. I'm sure it'll be the same way for PTF, but we figured that thing out on the fly. Uh, but it's always a good time. We typically have a good turnout and hopefully we can just continue to build upon this. Uh, and, and as I mentioned with the whole Santa Anita with the, the player friendly sort of takeout wagers, you know, this is a very friendly takeout kind of opportunity in the grand scheme of things. Low, low entry point, $20 buy-in. Uh, it's it's just it's a it's a great opportunity to get involved in contests. If you've been a little intimidated in the past, come along. If you don't have success right away, not the end of the world. You have many many more opportunities down the road, and we'll talk about some strategy things, and we'll talk about some of the races going on during the contest and that upcoming weekend, especially when we get into the proper Breeders' Cup Challenge Series. And I know we're already sort of in full swing. We had a couple this past weekend, a Memorial Day weekend, but. Starting next week with Belmont Stakes Day, there are going to be a few winning your ends. So uh, PTF and I, we usually chop those things up. We occasionally have guests. Again, you can join us on all the In The Money Media channels. You can play over on horseplayers.com. Uh, Breeders' Cups channels on social will typically put us out as well. So uh, be sure to join us on Thursday. More information to come. Horseplayer Happy Hour is back. If you can't tell, this isn't where I typically record. This is out on our back deck. The baby's inside. We are taking pictures later on, but I needed to try out some stuff. If I'm going to be on the move, not always afforded the luxury of being able to be down in the office to record. This is actually being done on my laptop and my iPhone. Not bad on the grand scheme of things. I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised. Uh, I don't know why I'm surprised. You know, the camera on the iPhone is as good as any camera that you can find. So here we are, a um, little mobile setup. Hopefully the audio and the lighting isn't too, too bad. I don't think it is based on what I heard from the little open there. This week's show, kind of tying back into last week, the idea of who's the best three-year-old? Is it early voting? Is it epicenter? Is it rich strike? Is it someone else? Is it a horse that we don't even know about yet? Among the big races on Memorial Day at Santa Anita was the Hollywood Gold Cup. And in my head, I saw the field and I said, you know what? I've always believed in royal ship. And I was a believer in Stiletto Boy, especially after that run in the Pegasus. I thought, you know what, he there are races for him, and probably of the grade one variety, that he can go and take advantage of this year. And a five-horse grade one going a mile and a quarter, maybe the distance would be pushing it a little bit for him, but big picture, boy, that's a pretty sweet spot. And the same for Royal Ship. You can't ask for much more than that. And there goes Harvard, who, if I'm being honest... I, I didn't know who that was prior to the race. There goes Harvard, goes and wins the Hollywood Gold Cup, earns a 100 buyer speed figure, and look, he won it fair and square. There was no, no denying that, no two ways around it. For me, the bigger sort of takeaway is, okay, maybe this horse is one that's just kind of coming into his own, but beyond that, who are the good older horses? Because a 100 buyer, if we're calling a spade a spade, probably not going to be good enough to win a race like the Breeders' Cup Classic in November. Breeders' Cup's at Keeneland this year. But if if a horse like Royal Ship isn't what I thought he was, which apparently he's not, if and I haven't read anything about any injuries, uh, but Stiletto Boy, this didn't work out for him. You know, all credit to Michael McCarthy. And I just pulled up Jay Privman's article in the Daily Racing Form. Remember when I talked about last week having a three-year-old and, you know, take a shot? What do you have to lose, especially if you look at it and say, we're not, we're not terrified of anyone? Uh, let's see. Quote from Michael McCarthy to Santa Anita's publicity. Small field, you have to take a shot. The horse is doing well, and sometimes you just have to take a chance. Well done, Michael McCarthy. I mean, that's, that's it in a nutshell. Sometimes you just, you roll the dice. And if it doesn't work, no big deal. I mean, what do you have to lose? It's a five-horse field in a grade one for 400 grand. Next weekend, you're going to have a bigger field. And I know a mile and a half is a bit of a, an anomaly, but take a shot. You got one chance to run in a race like that. I don't see anything wrong with taking a chance. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Nobody's going to you know, sit there and say, can you believe that they tried that? Well, I'm, I shouldn't say that. There will be people, but they're, th those people are jackasses anyway. There's the baby. How is it? Is it too loud? All right, great. See, it's not too loud. 
I was afraid of that too, waking the baby up. I digress. We're back. The idea to me that you could have a horse like There Goes Harvard, who I believe was coming out of a turf race, go and win one of the bigger races in California leaves quite a bit to be desired. And maybe this is a horse that's wanted this sort of thing long distance on dirt all along. But when I looked at his PPs, I didn't see a superstar. But I appreciate Michael McCarthy saying, look, we're not that far off these horses. Let's take a chance. Who knows? Crazy things happen. It's a horse race. So he goes, wins that race, earns a 100 buyer. Even money, Royal Ship is third. Stiletto Boy finishes fourth. I, my gut tells me none of them are factors as far as the true classic contenders are concerned. And I know it's only May, about to be June, but you already need to start having a bit of an eye on the Breeders' Cup. Because once Belmont comes and goes, that's what everyone is gearing up for. I know you've got your summer meetings at Del Mar and Saratoga, and they're going to have their big races, but their big races are typically sort of the, the intermediary goals to get to the big one at the end in the Breeders' Cup Classic. I don't see any of these horses factoring in. And then I started kind of jogging my brain going, okay, well, if I'm thinking that about the three-year-olds, about who's the best, well, who's the best older male? I'm going to run down some names. You tell me. And this is going to be the entire show. It's not going to be a super long one this week. But give out a few points and then perhaps why. And I've, I've said foolish things in the past. Maybe this will look really, really dumb on Saturday night. Why a race at Churchill Downs on Saturday could be a rather important one, big picture. But first, let's start with some of the other options. Okay, there goes Harvard now as a grade one winner. Again, I, I love that they did this. They took a chance. They got the job done. I don't know that I look at him and think he's a Breeders' Cup horse. Probably too early to truly say, but based on his body of work, Seems a little unlikely. Uh, Royal Ship, I, I like him, but I'm done with him. He just he clearly isn't this good. And Stiletto Boy, you got to say, you know what? Okay, maybe the water is a little too deep for you. If it's none of them, what about Country Grammar, who won the Dubai World Cup? He finished second in the Saudi Cup. He's a horse that loves a mile and a quarter. Uh, you know, Keeneland's going to be an X factor for many of these horses because it'll be, for the most part, the first time that they've run there. Some of them have. Uh, or will have when the race actually unfolds. But Country Grammar, I think he's a nice horse. I've liked him all along. I made the argument when we were over in Saudi Arabia that he's always been an underrated horse here in the States for whatever reason. Um, you know, do I think he's a superstar? No. I think if you if the right circumstances, he can certainly be beaten. But he is a true mile and a quarter horse through and through two turns. It sounds like the goal for him is going to be P Classic, and then who knows what's after that. Life is good. I think from a brilliant standpoint, I think he still may be among the most brilliant in this entire group. But boy, I don't know. Dubai is kind of a hard one to get out of your head, isn't it? I, I just, I, I have to wonder if 10 furlongs is too much for him. Arguably the best horse. But if you can't get the distance, it doesn't matter. So life is good, questionable. Country grammar, fine, makes sense. Hot Rod Charlie, you know, I don't have any major knocks against him. He's rock solid. Uh, other than, more often than not, he finds one or two better than him. Now, maybe when he comes over here, keep in mind, he was based in Dubai for the whole beginning part of the season. Uh, I believe they're pointing to the Stephen Foster. Uh, I'll be down at Churchill Downs for that race, NBC. That'll be July 2nd, I believe. He's a good horse. Mile and a quarter is not a, really a problem for him. He can be forward. He can kind of make his own trip. But until he takes that step, and when I say the step, I don't even mean from a speed figure standpoint because he stacks up very favorably, or at least competitively with some of these horses. He just always seems to find one or two better. And he'd be a great horse to own, great horse to be involved with, I, until he proves that he's got that sort of, you know, win at all cost kind of, kind of vibe to him. You know... This is going to sound really bad, and those of you that don't pay attention to golf, I apologize. Oh, and by the way, somebody pointed out that I didn't mention the Matsuyama no-show at the PGA last week. I apologize. I'll own up to that. You know I'm not afraid to own up to a loss. 
Um, it was just, you know, I had the hockey game on. I had a lot of things. So I apologize. Hideki, nowhere. Terrible pick. Uh, Hot Rod Charlie reminds me of somebody like Xander Shoffley, who, really good. Always kind of in contention in the mix. Very rarely, and I mean in the, the biggest events. So let's say, you know, one of the majors or as far as racing is concerned, you know, a Breeders' Cup, a Kentucky Derby. Um, you know, we'll find out where he goes over the summer. But always, he's there, but he can't quite get it done. Maybe this is the year. Maybe he'll put it all together when he comes back over here. Uh, but we saw it in Dubai, you know. And he, by, the, by the way, I think he finished, what did he finish? Second? And it looked like he finished second by default. It was a bit of a gross race, all things considered. Uh, but that's another story. Mandaloon. I, I don't know what you do with Mandaloon. I've liked him for a long time. It's hard for me to really look at the run in Saudi Arabia and say there's anything positive to pull from that. Um, he's still yet to cross the wire first in a grade one. That, that's a fact. He is a dual grade one winner, and he is yet to actually hit the wire first in either of them. Uh, he's a good horse. I, I think he probably wants to go shorter. That's just my gut. More and more I watch him. I think maybe he's a one-turn miler, seven-eighths. Uh, doesn't mean he can't get out to a mile and an eighth. I've talked about that in the past, that just because you want to do one thing doesn't mean you're incapable of doing something else. Frosted. Is the one I always, always, always go back to. He was a—he was just an exceptionally talented horse. But when you see that Met Mile, it's hard to argue that maybe that's what he wanted to do all along. Was he a one-turn seven-eighths, one-turn miler? But he was just so damn good that a mile and an eighth going two turns wasn't a problem for him. Eh, he pushing it when he got out to a mile and a quarter. That might be Mandaloon, but I, really, I, I can't be comparing Mandaloon to Frosted right now. They're, they're not even in the same ballpark talent-wise. Mandaloon needs to prove that he is actually this good. I hate to say it, because again, I like him. I like him a lot. But he, to, the, to right now, to this point, it, he just doesn't stack up. Stiletto Boy and Royal Ship already talked about. Express Train. Now, I don't know. I didn't read anything. I don't know where he was, why he wasn't in this race. Maybe he's dinged up a little bit. Um, but in my heart of hearts, I can't, I can't believe that Express Train... I know Express Train. Really nice horse. And I feel like I say that about many horses. Really nice. Would love to be involved. He's a grade one winner. Good horse. Is he a, When you see Express Train, do you think Breeders' Cup Classic? I don't. And, and it's not like he's a fresh face. He's been around for a minute. And all of a sudden, now he, he could arguably be one of the better ones. I just, I don't. I, I can't believe that he's the best that we have at this point, or one of the best. I mentioned the three-year-olds. Maybe they're sort of the wild cards in that you don't have a standout older horse right now anyway. doesn't seem. And maybe, maybe it is early voting. Maybe he is boss. Maybe it's epicenter. Maybe it's Mo Donegal or Rich Strike or Zandon or, you know, keep going down the list. Maybe it's a horse that we haven't even really gotten fully into just yet. Maybe it's Jack Christopher, for all we know. Um, it's a good group, but I think it's far too early to be saying that any one of them is going to be boss. I can't figure out which one's the best three-year-old. Probably an indictment on the older horses if I'm like, yeah, but whoever the best one of them is might actually be the best of the whole lot. One horse that I think many people will look toward anyway as possibly the best older male. And, and I'm only looking at the males right now. Females, that's a whole other can of worms just simply because I think it's a... Oh, it's very much like this group. I guess Latruska's boss, but I, I, you know, I don't really... I, I think she can be beaten with circumstances. After her, I mean, you could go six, seven different ways. And usually, usually, it's the same kind of analogy with, with football. If you have two quarterbacks, do you really have one if you have two? It's so rare to have many, many good ones. In all likelihood, you have many, many mediocre ones. None of them are standouts. Because if you had a standout, you would say, there's one, and then there's everyone else. So again, with the, with the quarterback... 
If you've got two quarterbacks on your roster and you can't figure out which one is the starter, in all likelihood, neither of them are all that good. They're both pretty good, but neither of them is a star. I guess Olympiad is, is one that presents some, some intrigue. He's on a tear right now. Bill Mott has taken his time with him. He is not overshot with this horse. He's, he's placed him appropriately, which, to no surprise, the old school trainers, it's what they do, whether it's him, whether it's Suge, who we'll talk about in a minute. He looks like a real threat in the division. I love his tactical ability. He doesn't have to have the lead. He's going to be forwardly placed, though. He can push faster paces or sit off of slower ones and still kick, like we saw in that Ali Sheba. The pace in the grand scheme of things is pretty pedestrian. Uh, he got into a battle between horses at the top of the lane, Wayburn to the inside, Happy Saver to the outside, and fended off Happy Saver. Granted, maybe he was a little bit short and needed the race, but Olympia had kicked away from him pretty emphatically. He has buyers uh, in his last four races, 103, 103, 102, 101. Strong, very solid. I don't think a mile and an eighth is going to be a problem for him. mile and a quarter, who knows? That could be a different story. Uh, my only question or my only sort of rebuttal to the idea of, well, if he is the boss with buyers of 103, 103, 102, and 101, A, how much different is that than a horse like Epicenter, who now has three consecutive triple-digit buyers in that 100 to 102 range? B, I mean, again, it, it was with... Thing, with a very, very comfortable trip, but early voting has run faster than that already. And he's only run four times. So maybe that is answering the question that, that maybe you know early voting or one of these three-year-olds is just going to take this division by the horns and say, I'm king now. I'm the captain. But Olympiad, to this point, he seems pretty interesting. He's consistent. And I guess that really, really, when you look at these horses... Consistency is kind of the thing that's missing for most of them, isn't it? Country grammar, I guess, is consistent, but he just doesn't run all that often. I mean, he's run, what, four times in 16 months, something like that? Life is good. He's consistent, but the distance is the thing I think that's concerning. He got a little drifty at the end of the Pegasus. It was at a mile and an eighth on a track that he figured to enjoy. You know, by on a quarter, he was ready to fall down at the end of that race in Dubai, and it's not like they were going crazy as far as speed was concerned. Hot Rod Charlie, again, he is consistent, but he's not remarkable. Mandaloon is wildly inconsistent. Stiletto Boy is inconsistent. Royal Ship's inconsistent. Uh, and, and, and both of them, frankly, probably aren't really of this caliber. Uh, Express Train, is he is pretty consistent. But to me, he's about a 100 buyer kind of horse. And for 100 is not typically good enough to win a race like the Breeders' Cup Classic. And maybe I'm going way too far down the road. But I do. I, I break the racing season up into two six-month segments. Derby to Breeders' Cup, and then just after the Breeders' Cup to the Derby. They're six months apart. Once the Breeders' Cup is over, all eyes are on the two-year-olds, soon-to-be three-year-olds, into the Derby and the Triple Crown, and then Derby to the Breeders' Cup. Once you get through the Triple Crown, all eyes are focused on the Breeders' Cup. It's just kind of the, the nature of the beast. Olympiad does make sense. But I brought up the idea that there's a race happening on Saturday. It is not a graded stake. It's a stake. It's not graded, though. Happening at Churchill Downs that I think could be, could hopefully, potentially, offer a, a little bit of Clarity, maybe? Or at least throw some new names into the, into the mix. Let's start with Scalding. Scalding's trained by Shug. Four-year-old, continues to improve. If you are strictly looking at buyer speed figures, he is quite slow. You, you couldn't really look at him and say he's a Breeders' Cup caliber runner. But when you consider he was a maiden in January, he'd only run three times. Broke his maiden in his third start. First time going out to two turns. Horse has never lost going two turns. Goes from a maiden at, Tam at uh, Gulfstream. Goes to an N1X at Tampa. Wins. Goes to the Grade 3 Challenger at Tampa. Wins. 
in a race that the figs on a buyer standpoint are, are far too low. They should be closer to a, you know, he earned a 91, should be at like a 101. I would say on the low side, a 97 or a 98. And then he goes to the Ben Li at Keeneland. And I'm watching the race. I picked him that day. I bet him that day. And my wife and I are in one of the towns just a little south of where we live. And I'm watching it. And I go, this horse, he's legit. Making a giant move on the far turn. Opens up at the top of the lane. I go, oh, this is, this is legit. This is big time. And then all of a sudden, he flips to his left lead. And he just starts kind of looking around. And his ears are up. And in my head, I'm like, ah, Jesus. Just when I was ready to be all in on him. But then I went back and watched it again. And I don't think him popping to his left lead the way that he did was any kind of a sign of him getting tired because that was the longest he had ever gone. He did, first time at a mile and an eighth. When you watch his ears pop up, keep in mind, he put two, two and a half on that field rather quickly. I think he just got bored out there. And some horses do that. He still only raced six times. If you believe the buyer of a 97 and you believe that the challenger, like I do, is probably closer to a 97 on the low side, maybe up into a triple digit on the higher side, Timeform US had the Keeneland race as a 123, which translates to about a 103. Now, if you use that and you think about the challenger, which they had as a 121, it's got a couple of triple digit buyers in his back pocket looks very interesting going forward i'll be very curious to see what we get from him on saturday you would assume a good performance on saturday in the blame moves him to the stephen foster which i'll be at churchill downs for fourth of july weekend nbc but if it's not scalding maybe american revolution now i feel like many of us have forgotten about american revolution because it's been so long since we last saw him uh, Dave Grenning wrote in a column for the Daily Racing Forum that this horse was supposed to go on Memorial Day yesterday, on Monday, in the commentator at Belmont Park for New York Breads, going a mile. Race didn't fill. He ends up here in the blame. If you want to look at that as a negative, that's fine, to each their own. Uh, to me, it's actually a positive because when I, whenever I've watched this horse, I feel like longer is what he wants. I actually picked and bet him in the Pennsylvania Derby. I didn't think he ran poorly behind Hot Rod Charlie and Midnight Bourbon. And when you take a look and see the kind of trip that he pulled that day, he's basically five paths wide, rounding the first turn, wide down the backside, wide rounding the far turn, and the top two were one-two the whole way, and they scooted clear. They had a lot more seasoning than he did at that point. They had more speed than he did at that point. Not going to hold the... I, and, and by the way, that race was one of the, the livest races you're going to see from 2021 at Pennsylvania Derby. You had Folsom in there. You had Speaker's Corner in there. You know, Weyburn was in there. This horse was in there. And again, the top two horses that we talked about. Hot Ride Charlie and Midnight Bourbon. Really strong race. He comes back. Uh, I believe it was the Evan Shipman. Wins that at Belmont Park by 100 lengths over a sloppy track. Big fig. And then comes back and wins the Cigar Mile. And again, if you're someone just watching the tape, especially if you hadn't, if you didn't know the result for the Cigar, and you're watching them come down the backside and go into the far turn, American Revolution is in and amongst horses, 2-3 path. And I believe, I want to make sure I'm getting it right, I believe it was Luis Saez. I mean, they start really pumping on this horse. And he's just kind of spinning his wheels. It was, it was Saez. If you didn't know that he would go on to win, you would say he might run last. But that's kind of him in a nutshell. You got to really push on this horse to get him to go. I don't want to say he's lazy, but I think he's one of those that just needs constant urging. And especially at a distance like a mile. He's not a one turn miler. Going back to what I mentioned earlier with Mandaloon and Frosted, the idea of. He's just that good that he can have success doing something he doesn't really want to do. He's never had an opportunity to go longer than a mile and an eighth before. I think this horse would run 10 miles. They gave him an opportunity. 
He's a New York bred. He's by constitution. He's out of a super saver mare. I think he wants every bit of a mile and a quarter. And if this wasn't the plan, maybe that's a bit of a red flag that they wanted to go and run against New York breads. But to be fair, if, if I have a comebacking horse, we haven't seen him since the beginning of December, so he's been gone for a minute. This is probably nothing more than a means to an end. I would expect him to run well. I won't be surprised if he loses. But I personally like him going two turns instead of going a one-turn mile. I know it's against a tougher group of horses. Probably not ideal. But you would think this would set him up very well for whatever start number two is. And start number two could either be the Stephen Foster, if he takes to the racetrack down there in Louisville, or... The following week after the Foster, you've got the Suburban at Belmont. He loves Belmont Park. He's going to get a mile and a quarter to work with. And we know Todd's record, second off the bench. Todd with a target, prep, bang. Number two, we're going to fire. If I had to guess, if he runs well in either of those, he probably sits out the Whitney, and they get him ready for the mile and a quarter Jockey Club Gold Cup on Labor Day weekend at Saratoga. That would be my guess. But... That's assuming he comes back as good as we saw him at the end of his three-year-old year, and hopefully better. But the thing that I'm encouraged about with a horse like American Revolution, not just that he's in Todd's care, I think somehow, some way, and, and I know a lot of it has to do with how good Chad has been lately, run through the whole Baffert thing, and Brad Cox, and some of these other trainers that have had a great deal of success. Pletcher is, Pletcher is as good as it gets. He has grade one horses on dirt, on turf, sprinting, going long. Uh, I was always of the, sort of the thought of, well, you know, how many older horses does he typically have? Guess what? He's, you know, smacked me around with that sort of idea or that thought over the past handful of years because not just a horse like Vino Rosso, but, you know, we, we've seen what he can do with some of these really, really good older horses. Todd is as good as it gets. And... Uh, for him to have a horse like this, who they they brought along slowly, they gave him time. Yeah, they took a shot in the Pennsylvania Derby, and I'm sure some people will look at it and say, yeah, he didn't run that well. Uh, big picture, I thought he ran just fine there. Comes back in the Empire Classic, not the Evan Shipman. Wins that one by a country mile. Big, big figs. And then he comes back and he wins the cigar. I maintain doing something he doesn't really want to do. I think he is a longer, just, I think he's a proper router. Mile and an eighth, mile and a quarter, I think that's in his wheelhouse. My assumption, my guess would be, if he does well on Saturday, doesn't have to win it, he got to run well. If he does, the door is open for the Stephen Foster at a mile and an eighth, or they can bring him back to New York, he gets an extra week. We know Todd typically likes to space him out a little more. You can get him into the Suburban at a mile and a quarter at a track that he loves in Belmont Park. I would assume at that point you probably give, you pass on the Whitney, and then you look at a race like the Jockey Club, it's Saratoga, Labor Day weekend, mile and a quarter. He runs well there. Maybe you just run fresh into the Breeders' Cup at a mile and a quarter. I, I'm very interested. He is probably the horse that I'm most intrigued with out of all the ones, out of all the names that we just rattled off. Because I think he's very good, and I still think he's a little bit, he's unexposed. I know what some of those other horses are. I don't know what, American Revolution could be. I don't know what Scalding could be. I, I kind I know what I know what Royal Ship is. I, I know what Stiletto Boy is. To be fair, there goes Harvard. Maybe he's one that we don't truly know what he is. But boy, he's run a lot. I think it was just a brilliant call from Michael McCarthy. And the three-year-olds, they are the they are the the complete unknown because there's no telling how good early voting could be. There's no telling if Epicenter can improve. There's no telling if one of these other horses, don't forget about Messier or someone like that, if they all of a sudden come back and are better than ever. Jack Christopher, you know, it, it's a very interesting time and an interesting group. It's just more a matter of right now, it's about as clear as mud. I thought the three-year-old picture was a little bit cluttered. The older males, equally so, if not more. Let me know your thoughts beneath the video player on YouTube or on Twitter, at Bernie or underscore Matt. Who is the best older male right now? And I say older, I guess you could 
throw in, let's call it the classic division. Is it one of the three-year-olds or is it one of the names I just rattled off or is it somebody totally different? I wish there was some talk of some European horse that somebody was pointing toward, you know, the Breeders' Cup and dirt and things like that. I know for, for a bit there was chatter about that at the end of last year anyway with uh, the Gosden horse, whose name is slipping my mind, Mishrif, but, you know, who knows if he's even... I have no idea anything about that after the, the disaster in Saudi Arabia, but I, I just it's a really wide-open space at the moment, and we know how quickly things can change. Uh, but I thought it was at least worth acknowledging, knowing that we're coming up to some pretty big... We had a big one on Monday... And we're coming up to some pretty big races for older horses. And at the moment, there's no leader. There's not. Life is Good's loss in Dubai, I think, opened the door wide open. And maybe he'll prove that that was a one-off and he just didn't like it over there or whatever it may be. And he is a mile and a quarter horse and he's just better. But I think his loss at least opened the door to some other possibilities. I'm most interested to see what happens in that blame on Saturday at Churchill Downs. American Revolution, Scalding. You got some other good horses in there as well. Proxy is a horse that's always hinted at ability. I really thought he'd be sort of a four-year-old developer, and he's still kind of goofy. But that that could be, Saturday at Churchill could be a very, very important day. Big picture. We could look back five months from now and say this was a race that that sort of was foreshadowing some things down the road. Again, let me know your thoughts beneath the video player on YouTube or on Twitter, at Bernie or underscore Matt. Questions, comments, concerns, same spots. You know how to get a hold of those. Uh, rate, review, subscribe. If you listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, in the moneypodcast.com. If you watch over on YouTube, make sure the bell icon's lit up. That way you get notified anytime new content is uploaded to the channel. Again, Thursday, Thursday, Thursday. Horse Player Happy Hour is back. Myself and PTF will be going over a handful of races. The contest will be up over on horseplayers.com. And again, it's going and supporting a good cause. And you've got some big, big prizes that you can be playing for for a very, very small, small buy-in. So something you definitely want to get involved with. We will be pumping much more out on social over the next few days. Uh, that's going to do it for episode 117. Uh, next week, Belmont Stakes Week. Looking forward to that. I believe, I, I, I guess I'm in studio. We're not going to be at Belmont Park. We are going to be in Stamford for that show, but looking forward to rejoining the NBC team down there. And uh, again, getting ready for a busy, busy summer. The Breeders' Cup Challenge Series, bopping around. And first stop following the Belmont Stakes will be Louisville, Churchill Downs. Who knows? Maybe we'll see some of these horses that we're talking about in this race on Saturday showing up in the Stephen Foster down there. But first things first. Let's get through this weekend. Let's get through the Belmont Stakes and wrap up the Triple Crown for 2022. Thank you again, however you listen best of luck however you play whatever you play wherever you play it's been episode 117 the Matt Bernier Show